back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and today we continue the showcase for Zombicide Undead or Alive from Cool Mini or Not. If you haven't checked out my setup video to get Mission 1, the bandwagon, to the table, as you can see here in the top right-hand corner, there'll be a link to that video. You can check it out to see how we got all this set up. But right now, we're going to dive into the narrative, the objectives, and special rules for this mission, and then into the gameplay. The trains are coming and ain't gonna stop. This here's our chance to skedaddle out of this zombie-ridden outpost. Ain't gonna leave empty-handed, though. Place is chock-full of bounty weapons that'll soon be ours. There are no class limitations across the four classes within Zombicide Undead or Alive for this mission. Our objectives are as follows. We need to prove our worth and get in the train. And we need to accomplish the objectives in a specific order in order to win the game. The very first one is to get one bounty weapon per survivor. So we're going to need to get a total of six as we have a posse of six individuals. Now some of them can be found in the town as you can see by the objective markers around the town. There's four of them, but we'll also need to accomplish accomplish some feats to complete the count fully. Now, as I just described, just simply going and taking an objective will not only get you a top card from the bounty deck, in this case, the top card is the bounty weapon, the Henry Repeater, but also five AP or adrenaline points on your dashboard, which is certainly going to impact the number of zombies coming into play across the game. Now, the next thing to mention is we can strictly go right after the feat on a bounty card if we don't wish to be going after objectives on the map itself for the four that are out there. We can simply just go ahead and try to accomplish gaining 10 AP or adrenaline points or more with a dynamite. If we do this, we get the bounty card and we're also progressing our mission. So two different paths. We have to strategically think as to which is better in which instance. Once each of our posse members has a bounty weapon on them, the next thing we need to do in order to win the game is to exit with all the survivors on the train. There can't be any zombies on board the train either. But we need to be careful. The train may enter the board before you get all the required bounty weapons, making things really tough to win. Now, the special rules indicated something we did during the setup video, which was to place a blue objective token in the indicated zone on the illustration within the rulebook. And that is this zone right here, which if you want to take a look, you can see it's denoted as a zone across all of this. The white area here of the railroad track also adds to the two lines which are here, making this an entire space all together. And it's in this way you're going to be moving the blue objective token over time. So unlike all the other red objectives out there, which can get you bounty weapons and some AP points, you're not going to be able to take the blue objective. The point of this thing is that at the end of each phase, you're going to move this blue objective token one zone forward on the railroad heading left to right. And then once it leaves the board, the train is going to enter through the same location. So as you can clearly see, the objective will sit over here. It's going to move at the end of every phase into the next space, heading right all the way to the very end of the board and then off the board. And then in that location, the train's going to come in. The final thing to mention around special rules is not only when taking a red objective do you get five AP and a bounty card, of course, if there is a bounty card to obtain, but you can also freely reorganize your dashboard. Lastly, let's talk about something we really need to understand, and that is how do we avoid losing a game of Zombicide Undead or Alive? There are three ways you can lose the game. The first way is if any survivor from your posse has been eliminated, you want to be really careful about this because it can also include companions. You might have a mission where you start with a companion or you obtain one during gameplay. Maybe you free the individual from a certain location and you have to move them from one location to the next or protect them. Long story short, protect everybody that isn't undead at all costs. You don't want to see any of your companions or survivors go down, otherwise you lose the game. Now in this case for mission number one, no companions involved, so I only have to care about my posse and keeping them alive. Now the second way you can lose the game is if a mission objective all of a sudden becomes unattainable. In other words, it's not possible to complete it anymore based on the game state. That also results in a loss for you. The final way is as soon as the seventh spawn zone becomes active on the board. So the thing you're going to want to do is watch out for the abomination spawn zone and the corpse piles as that can have an impact on how quickly those can ratchet up to seven. Now just to tie up the loose ends around what I mentioned just moments ago around having seven active spawns and that would trigger a loss of the game. How do you get to that number of spawn zones you might ask? Well when you set up the game here in this mission number one you have two mobile spawn zones which are in orange. You have a starting spawn zone in yellow way up top north there and then you have an inactive 
Abomination spawn zone, which is going to be activated the second an Abomination is in play. When the Abomination is killed off, it becomes inactive. So that one's going to be very, very random, kind of turning on and off and on and off. We'll talk more about managing not only the Abomination token, but managing the mobile spawns later on. But you're probably wondering, how do we get up to seven active ones? It still seems a little weird. Well, there are these things called corpse piles, which are in different buildings around the game board. There's one here, one here, and one way up up north just adjacent to the room in the top right hand corner. Now these rooms can house corpse pile spawn zones which can pop up and if all three of them come into fray and the abomination one goes from inactive to active you now have seven spawn zones in play and at that point in time you would lose the game. So how do those corpse pile spawn zones come into play? Well, the second individual moves into a building with a corpse pile, the spawn token will be placed there. It is possible with holy water to destroy them. They can be flipped over and made inactive. And that's going to do it in terms of the setup video prior, showing you how to get mission number one, the bandwagon to the table. The overview I've just gone over in terms of the win and loss condition, objectives and special rules. At this point, you're going to see how it all ties together as we begin gameplay, seeing whether we can survive and accomplish a win inside of mission number one. The first individual I'm going to activate is going to be Carl. He is in orange. Now, looking at his equipment that he got from the very beginning in the setup video, he has a pan, a frying pan. So being a brawler character, he's okay with being up close and personal, but that gives him very limited options at range. I really want to make sure he has the ability to shoot from range as well as another option. So what we're going to do here is have him move into that room and we're going to take that objective. So out of the three actions that I have for Carl, the first one's moving in, which allows him to move one space. He's walking through a doorway, which is perfectly okay, into a main area here. The second he walks inside this building, a spawn zone appears, one specific to corpse piles. It's going to stay there until we can destroy it. Carl's second action was to take the objective token, which he's done. I'm going to be increasing him from 0 to 5 on the AP track. Also, he gets the Henry Repeater here, which is going to be his bounty weapon. Now, experienced Zombicide players are going to realize right off the hop here, there are no doors inside of Undead or Alive. All these entryways are wide open, which, again, helps to remind you of the fact that when you go through one of these doors, you're not going to be spawning individuals like you would have in prior iterations per each of the rooms in a building. It's all about the spawn tokens. And you saw one pop right in the corpse area there, which is an active token that we're going to have to start dealing with going forward, hopefully looking for some holy water in order to take it down. So Carl has equipped his Henry Repeater, and as you'll see down below, for his AP points, he's up to five. For Carl's third action, he's going to choose to search the room he's in. And he ended up finding some water. It states here, discard, gain three AP. Faithful may discard at range zero to one within line of sight and select a spawn zone. Abomination or mobile spawn zone tokens, you can move it to the starting spawn zone. So basically this allows you, if you're a faithful character, to move one of the two orange spawn zones all the way into the first starting spawn zone. So you can kind of group them into one area and control the number of enemies coming out of certain portions of the board rather than having them spill at you from every angle. It also mentions here that the corpse pile spawn token, you can flip it to its inactive side if you're using it against that instead. So this might be something to give to my faithful character, Thomas, in blue. For now, that's going to end off Carl's turn as he's used all three of his actions. We're going to move to a new survivor. Now let's take a quick look at the next bounty weapon we could acquire in one of two ways. Again, taking another objective token if we want to do that, or trying to accomplish the feat that's on the card. Now why am I even mentioning this? Because strategically you want to start thinking about what you want to accomplish. Remember, every time we jump into a building that has a corpse pile, you're going to have a new spawn to deal with. That's going to make life difficult for you if you don't have holy water or water, which I just picked up luckily, that a faithful can use in order to deal with a corpse pile. So you want to keep in mind the fact that you still need to in this mission with six survivors and everyone needing a bounty weapon you're going to need at least two of the feats off the bottom of these cards in order to get to the six anyway so it would make sense to kind of go after those two early in the game and make it happen when you don't have a lot of clutter and craziness happening versus going after the four objectives first then trying to accomplish the last two feats and being completely overwhelmed so what I'm going to try to do here is go after this kill two zombies or more in a zone with another survivor in a single turn. Now, I kind of have to set this up. I have to make it happen. So it's okay. We have some spawn zones close by. We should be able to, with luck, hopefully, if we get two corpse pile spawn zones opened up in the next little bit here, and they spawn two or more zombies, we can set ourselves up in order to get this feat accomplished. 
The next survivor to activate is going to be the blue individual. That is Thomas, the faithful class. He is going to use one to move into the same space as Carl. For his second action, he's going to dig around inside the space in order to find something, and he ends up with a knife. Not a bad find. So Thomas has equipped the knife, and with his third action, he's going to go ahead and do a trade here. He's going to give the knife, which is a great melee weapon for an individual that focuses on melee, which is Carl as a brawler, he's going to trade that knife to Carl for the water that Carl found earlier. Now, it's also worth mentioning I'll be using these purple cubes to denote which of my characters have already activated in a given round. So Thomas moved into the space, searched the space, and then traded. That is all the actions that he has. And again, what I'm trying to accomplish is setting up a situation situation where we can get a melee character into a space with enemies, two or more zombies, and be able to take them out in a single turn. If I can pull that off, I'm going to get the next bounty weapon. The next individual we're going to activate is going to be Jeb. He is a townsfolk, which allows him to search multiple times, so he's going to move from the area he is in right now into this room and search twice in a row. Looks like Jeb's eyes are a little keener inside that room when searching around than the other individuals. He was able to find a twin barrel shotgun and then finds another shotgun inside the room as well. Next up, we're going to activate Meg, who's just going to be using all her actions to move to the objective in the far right room. Just before she gets there, a corpse pile spawn token is placed, and she makes her way to the objective room. Next, we're going to activate Pablito, the individual in red here. He's going to use one action of his three to get inside the wagon, which has a mounted Gatling gun inside of it. It will mention inside the rulebook that if a Gatling gun is inside of a wagon, it's considered mounted, so you can't take the Gatling gun and go on a running spree with it. But there are other missions where the Gatling gun will not be inside of the wagon, and at that point, you can actually spend actions to move it around the game board. But we still can move the wagon with the Gatling gun, of course, so that's part of my plan. Now with Pablito's two other actions, he's basically going to choose to do nothing, which isn't exactly the best thing to do, but in this case, it doesn't make sense to be running around trying to search things. He'd never make it back for this plan. So he's done his turn. The next activation is going to be Trixie. And as she was outside of the wagon and wants to move a wagon from one space to the next, she's going to spend all three of her actions to move the wagon, everybody in it, and all the contents, of course, the Gatling gun included, all move together. And now we've got them nicely lined up for that corpse bond tile in the other room. Again, where you're shooting from an inside zone to an outside zone, or from an outside zone to an inside zone, you can only shoot as deep as one space in. There are, or there is, I should say, a class that can actually get around that. I believe that's the the townsfolk, if I'm not mistaken, but in this case, we only need to be one space in anyway. This is perfect because if some enemies show up here, we can literally just blast them away with the Gatling gun. That's going to do it for the player phase. Our entire posse has activated, and at this point, we're going to move into the zombie phase. The first step typically is to activate, to attack or move, but because we don't have any zombies to attack or move, we're skipping past this step number one. We're moving to spawning. We draw spawn cards starting with spawn zone one in yellow way up top north. So from the zombies activation deck, we flip over a card. We got ourselves brutes, and we're at the blue level. We know this by looking across our posse of survivors. Whoever has the most AP. We look at that dashboard and we see which color zone they're currently in. In this case, everybody's still in blue, so we're only looking at blue. But if we had somebody, for instance, that was in yellow, we'd be pulling and looking at the yellow area of the card. Regardless, in this case, it's going to be four. Four Brutes are now in play. We're going to continue spawning different spawn zones, moving clockwise around the game board. So the next one up is going to be a mobile orange spawn. It looks like the fun has already begun. We have an abomination coming out of the mobile spawn here. It states two different options here. So if there is no abomination on the board, we follow what it states at the very top, which is spawning one. We're going to grab a card from the abomination deck. Again, it's random, face down. We have no idea which one it is, and it will likely be something really nasty. And then we're going to flip all the abomination spawn tokens to their active side. We have one, so it will flip over and become active and be able to spawn. That's going to ramp things up already. Now it states here at the bottom, if there is all already an abomination in play, then that abomination just gets an extra activation. So you can see if you get too many of those cards when you have abominations on the board, they can come after you pretty quick. The abomination that we got is called the Bison. The Bison deals one wound to each survivor standing in zones. It moves into. Spawning does not count as a move. Well, it certainly doesn't look good. It is not that far away from my posse currently. Looks like we have some good news. We have two zombies showing up at the zombie corpse pile. You'd normally think that it would be a bad thing, but remember, for the feat we're trying to go against, we really wanted to have at least two zombies inside this area based on how I set myself up here with the Gatling gun, so that's good news. The other corpse pile spawn token has four runners coming out. 
The next spawn token has two brutes coming out of it. The final spawn token ended up being an abomination spawn token because, well, it was on its inactive side, but it went active the second we had an abomination come in play. I drew a card for it and got the abomination card. So it states if there is already an abomination on the board, it gets an extra activation. This is our very first zombie activation, so let's go ahead and talk about how we resolve it. Doesn't matter if it's a regular zombie or an abomination, it's resolved the same way. They're going to activate, they're going to try to attack on their activation, or they're going to try to move. Those are the two options. In this case, it cannot attack. There's nobody nearby for it to attack, so it's going to move. Now, there are special rules for each abomination. The core box one doesn't have anything special about it, but the additional abominations you can add to the game do. We'll talk about the specifics of this one in a second. Let's stay focused on activating it as per every other zombie would ever activate going forward and so with a move it needs to figure out where it's moving so there's a priority order to the destination zone it starts with looking for the zone with survivors in line of sight that has the noise token be it on the bang side or boom side in this case it cannot see anybody line of sight wise because line of sight is drawn orthogonally and not diagonally in either case, cannot see any survivors. So the next step is the zone with the most survivors in line of sight with no noise token. And that also cannot happen in this situation. So the final thing is, if there are no survivors visible to that zombie that activated, they move toward the zone with the noise token. And we do see a noise token. So it ends up being quite easy to determine where the zombie is going to move. In this case, the abomination just moves the shortest distance towards the noise token. The other great thing about Undead or Alive is there's only one noise token. A lot of prior iterations of Zombicide had multiple noise tokens all over the place, and that, of course, would come into play in terms of where the zombies were going to move, but it made things really, really fiddly, keeping track of all the noise tokens for all the noise generated. Now, my turn in the last round for the players was very easy because there wasn't any zombies out in the world, so there was no noise being generated. So because of this, the token still remains exactly where it started the game at. But as you'll see in the next round, when I start getting into some killing, depending on what weapons I'm using and depending what items I use, I'm going to be generating noise. And that's going to have the token moving to different areas or potentially flipping to a louder version of itself on its boom side. So what is special about the Bison Abomination? Well, the Bison deals one wound to each survivor standing in zones it moves into. Spawning does not count as a move. So basically when it spawns into the game, it's not gonna hurt any survivors that it spawns onto when it does. In this case here, it moved into a space. If there happened to have been survivor or survivors in that space, they all would have taken a wound. So this guy is basically just trampling through people. That'll do it for the zombie phase. Now we take a look at the noise token. If it's on its boom side, which it currently is not, but if it was, we'd flip it to its bang side. Now heading into this player phase, lots of things going through my head here. Got to keep an eye on the abomination. It's not close enough yet to be a problem, but you can see how we got two abomination activation cards in the last spawn round, which means this thing could really start moving quick. Got to get somebody that can potentially put three damage on that abomination in place. The only individual weapon that I have that's even close to that is the Henry Repeater at two damage, which is one of the bounty weapons that Carl is currently holding. However, it's only two damage, so it's not going to take out an abomination. I also don't have dynamite, which is another three damage item that I can use to kill an abomination. But I can use skills to try to bump that two to a three. Now on Thomas, my faithful character, he has a plus one damage during combat when he makes a combat attack so if I can get him the actual bounty rifle that Carl currently has by trading it I could get him into the streets to wait for the abomination to show up and then get the three damage that I need to take it down so that might be the route to go in terms of planning the other thing I'm trying to accomplish here in the player phase is trying to accomplish the feat on the current bounty weapon card it states to kill two zombies or more in a zone with another survivor so we have to put a survivor in kind of harm's way then kill the zombies. So in other words, if I was to move this individual into this area here with these two zombies and then maybe use the Gatling gun to shoot in, I could potentially kill off the zombies there, get the feet. The downside is if I miss on any of the dice, those are direct hits on my current posse member, the yellow one, which would be bad. Meg would be very hurt by that. The other option I have to get this feat done without putting my posse at risk of taking hits is a melee action in the same space as another posse member. That is probably the better route to go.
We'll start things off with Thomas, and just to mention, I'm using these cubes here to denote which characters have taken their turn, as I mentioned earlier, but these cubes do not come as part of the court box at all. You can use anything you have, really, to denote this if you're playing solo and controlling this many characters. We have water here. This is something I definitely want to use, so when I discard it, I gain 3 AP, and I'm going to do it right now. It says, Faithful may discard at range 0 to 1, so from here to there, no problem, within line of sight, and select a spawn zone. It states down here that if it's a corpse pile spawn zone, then flip it to its inactive side. It can be used right out of the backpack. It doesn't have to be equipped in your hand. So we're going to go ahead and discard this. We're going to take ourselves up by three. This is a good thing to do right now, I think. Not to five. We'll go to three. And we're going to take this spawn zone right here and flip it over. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a trade action with Carl. So Thomas is going to grab the Henry repeater, but he's going to give his Springfield over to Carl. Not bad, and for the final action for Thomas, he's gonna step outside of the building. Thomas is in the streets. I need to talk about his class tokens that he has, which are very cool. The Faithful class has these tokens, which I can potentially use if I spend an action once per turn. I can spend an action in order to get one into play. I can choose a space with zombies within line of sight. So I could have, while standing in this space here, I could have with line of sight here, place this token inside. And basically what it does is it prevents the activation of anybody inside of that area, which is pretty awesome. We'll talk more about that later on, but honestly, right now, what I want to do is I want to try and get Jeb to thin out the herd in here as much as he can, and then I'm going to actually get him to move into the space with the zombie, so when Carl goes in with his knife, he's able to take down, hopefully, two within his single turn to get himself a bounty weapon. So Jeb is activating next. I moved him, but he actually didn't move anywhere because he's inside the same location. He's got three actions to spend, and he's going to use his twin barrel shotgun, allowing him to roll two dice and it's a three plus in order to land hits so let's see how he does with his first shot he got himself a four and a six so Jeb did exactly what he needed to do. He got himself a great roll. He was easily over three on both of those rolls, taking out both zombies. He's going to go up in terms of AP by two, and he's now going to search in his space, and then his last action will be to move into the space with the zombies. Jeb's search ended up finding him a pistol. He literally has so many weapons right now. He's got a twin barrel shotgun, a regular shotgun, a Springfield starting rifle, and he's got this pistol now as well. Something else worth noting is that the bang token, because of his shot that he fired, in here moved from here to here the noise happened here that token will continue to move based on any time you use a weapon where you can see this icon on it now this wasn't the weapon i used to shoot but on the shotgun card that is on his dashboard it has the same icon jeb bravely dives into the room with the corpse pile and zombies in order to stand there so we can try and accomplish a feat Carl begins his activation by moving into the room, and we have a choice to make based on the equipment cards we have for Carl. Here's a look at Carl's loadout, and just so you know, we have this item which went into Jeb's inventory. I just moved it for now so you can actually see what's going on with Carl. We have the pan. It's a one die, five plus to make a hit, or the knife, one die, four plus to make a hit. Neither one of these are great. With only two actions left on Carl's turn to try to kill two zombies, I have to be pretty much perfect on both rolls if I use either one of these, but... There is a benefit here. Because I've got the knife equipped, it states in the bottom, add plus one die to another equipped melee weapon, meaning the pan actually rolls two dice at five plus. So that gives me four dice to try to kill two zombies, so long as I can get five or higher on two of those dice. So Carl is going to wield his pan, and he's going to really hope to land fives and sixes. If I can at least get one off this roll, I'm happy. If I get both, even more happy. Let's see. Oh, okay, we got one. We just squeaked by. That was a miss. That was a hit. One zombie down, and Carl gained an AP. Let's go ahead and roll these two. Come on, Pan, make it happen. The thing that's a little scary here, just so you guys know, is that the AP is currently at the brink of blue for Carl. If he kills this zombie, we go to yellow. And that happened a little bit quicker than I might have liked it, but if we can get the second bounty card, it might be okay. And I think we're going to get the third one here really quick. So we'd be about halfway through those objectives, and we would have or be at the yellow uh you know level so it's not terrible but let's see how this thing goes come on make it happen yes yes just barely we got the five that zombie is dead and carl does manage to complete the feat and gets the bounty weapon we completed the feat as it states here killing two zombies or more in a zone with another survivor and in a single turn perfect so we're gonna go ahead and now flip this over this is a great weapon for Carl to get being a brawler. This is a melee weapon, so in the same space, he can roll three dice and up to three plus in order to make hits. This is pretty awesome. 
Now, one thing that I have to talk about and I should have utilized in order to make it so it wasn't such a tight situation there is the Brawler class ability. And the Brawler has a really cool class ability it gets called Charge. Once per turn, the Brawler can spend an action to move up to two zones to a zone containing zombies and then perform one free melee action. So essentially, I would have actually been able to take a little bit more time with that if I hadn't have had it work out the way it did. So basically, you got to remember that in the future that the brawler having that ability allows it to just spend a single action to get a move and an attack out of that one whole action and it's worth mentioning that in terms of the noise token it does not move because we used a frying pan which does not generate noise doesn't have the noise icon on the card it's typically guns explosions gatling guns those types of things that are typically noisy they're going to have this token moving around now what's pretty awesome is the second that you go ahead and tip into the next category in terms of AP, in terms of color, you get to go ahead and select a skill. In this case, it's an additional action, which I can utilize right now. So we're gonna go ahead and take a peg here out of the reserve area, place it in here, and going forward, Carl is gonna get four actions. So he's gonna simply just slip back into this room. Next up, I'm gonna activate Meg. I can't see a reason why I shouldn't take the objective token at this point. So for one action of her three, she'll take that, gain five AP, and she's also gonna get the top bounty weapon card. She ends up getting a Colt Hunt line bounty weapon, and this one is a range one to three. You roll a single die, four plus is a hit, one damage, and it does, of course, make noise. Now, just before we go ahead with any more of Meg's actions, I want to talk about the final aspects of certain classes that I haven't touched on already. Of course, some of these you haven't even seen yet, but you'll see them in action as we go along. The Townsfolk also has what's known as a Home Defender ability on top of the ability for it to search more than once in a turn. It has this Home Defender, which allows them to ignore line of sight restrictions in building zones. So basically, it can see further into building zones than everybody else, which is just restricted to one. So that's worth noting because Townsfolk are very savvy about the town. They know the ins and outs of everything so they can use the layout of the buildings to their advantage, allowing them to shoot further in depth into those buildings. So that's worth keeping an eye on. Now, in terms of the individual we've activated, Meg, she is a gunslinger. This is the last class that I have not talked about at all. And the gunslinger is very interesting. It does something called fanning. Now you can see an example of fanning right on the actual starting card for Meg. It says fanning six plus instead of five plus, and that's because it's a starter card, so it's basically can do a cool ability of using fanning, but it's not as good as when it typically is used with better weapons. So the gunslinger uses a single pistol equipped in a hand to perform a ranged action, unloading the weapon at amazing speed. For this action, the pistol's characteristics are altered as follows. The range becomes unchanged, so it's still the same as depicted on the card. The dice is six. This value can be modified as usual with additional plus one die range skill, for example. The accuracy is five plus, so the value can be modified as usual again with skills or any anything else within the gameplay. The damage stays unchanged, so really the range and the damage are exactly the same, but everything else kind of gets an uptick. And the other thing to mention is that fanning produces a boom because it's such a loud, uh, you know, back to back of bullets firing off out of the gun that it makes an overall boom sound. So the token has to flip from bang to boom, making it much louder, much more noticeable. And then on top of it, after fanning, you have to reload your gun, similar to you would do with a shotgun where you shoot it and you have to reload, basically spending an action to do so, uh, wasting a little bit of time to get those bullets back in, but it makes sense when you're unloading an entire round of ammo. Meg's gonna go ahead and activate right now. She's going to shoot these individuals one space away. She's got two actions left. She'll use one to use her Colt Hunt line, which is her bounty weapon. So she's rolling a single die of four plus will be a hit. We'll see if we can take out the two zombies that are in there. We got a one, that is not good news. And we'll go ahead and roll again to see if we can take them out. And we got a four, that is gonna be one of the zombies killed off. The bang token moves over to where Meg is, her turn is done. We have two more survivors that haven't gone. I'm gonna activate Trixie. Trixie's right here in this space. She's gonna use her ability, which is her blue ability, the starting one that she has called Jump. This allows her to basically ignore the fact that normal characters have to go around and up the stairs to a platform like this, a balcony. Instead, she can literally climb it. So she's gonna jump up onto this platform, giving her a better vantage point into the open streets. Next, we're gonna activate Trixie, who's right here. She's gonna take a shot inside of this zone inside the building. She's using her Springfield, which she can shoot from one to two zones away. She's rolling a single die. A five plus will be a hit. Let's see if she can pull it off. She does, that's a five. That zombie is gone. She gains an AP. 
She moves into the zone and ends up finding water. This is very helpful, seeing as we have the faithful Thomas sitting out here, so he could eventually do a trade with her and maybe deal with this corpse pile spawn, hopefully soon. Now, I don't want to end my turn inside of a spawn zone. Not a really great idea. So I'm probably going to go ahead right now and have her step back out into the street. That's going to end off her turn, and the last person to go is Pablito, who is hooked up to a Gatling gun, which isn't a bad thing, and to be honest, I think he's not going to do all that much. He might get off the Gatling gun. If he does, it would cost 1 AP to get off, and then 1 AP in here, and then 1 to search, but then it would leave him in a spawn zone, and that doesn't really sound like a smart idea, so I might actually just end up forfeiting his turn unless there's some trading that's worthwhile doing for him, but I think for now I'm going to leave him alone, and we're going to probably, once we deal with the Abomination, try and push this wagon to about here in the center of the street so it can start doling out some damage. The last thing to update was the bang token that was in the space with Meg moves to the street zone where Trixie was when she took a shot to kill the last zombie in here. So that's the final resting place for that bang token. We're now moving to the zombie phase where we have a number of zombies that are going to activate at this given time, all of them moving. They're all on their way and I'm pretty terrified right now, but at least we dealt with one of the spawns. We're going to start now with spawning at the very top for the first spawn. The first spawn card has been revealed. It is Long Dead Walkers. There's six of them as we're in the yellow now. Next, we have four brutes coming in from the east. Really wish I could have dealt with that corpse spawn tile in the last turn. Wasn't able to. Close. But four walkers rise out of it. We took out this corpse pile spawn, so it gets ignored now. This one, still active here, has four walkers coming through. A total of six walkers coming out of that Abomination spawn zone. Again, we can deactivate that one if we can kill the Abomination, which is a major aim in the next player phase. We're now done with the zombie phase, and it's worth mentioning I want to make one correction from the end of the last phase. At the end of every round, you're going to flip the noise token to its bang side if it's on its boom side, but it also states if there's only a bang in play, it is moved to the zone with the most survivor. So make sure you don't miss that. Now, at the end of the last round, I didn't move that to the correct location. The good news is it had zero impact on anything gameplay-wise, but as the game goes on, and depending on where that token is, it could have a major impact. So make sure you get that right. And speaking of getting things right, I forgot something else, which is part of the special rules for this mission, but again, it won't impact gameplay as I caught it early enough, and that's the moving of the blue objective token along the train tracks. Remember, it has to get all the way to the very end of the board and then go off the board, then the train will arrive for the second part of our objective to get on board without any zombies being on board the train. So we need to move this thing based on going through two full rounds, so it will move two spaces to the right. Just like that, we're all squared away and caught up, and we can move into the next player's phase. I'm going to choose to activate Pablito. He is going to use the Gatling gun, which is currently here. So this is an escalation of range, which means it gets an additional die on top of whatever it already states. So it's three plus another die is four, and it's hitting on four plus. It does two damage, which is pretty good. But again, that's only per unit. So in this case, being that they're just walkers, doesn't really matter. If we can try to wipe all these out at once, it will be awesome. So the first action is to shoot this gun. Let's see how we do. Hopefully good. Oh my gosh, that was terrible. That's a whole bunch of ones that are useless and one hit. So after a barrage of bullets, only a single zombie killed off. The token for noise has flipped over to boom. And we're going to continue this exercise as this Gatling gun is able to be used to fire for one action. And I can go ahead and use this. I just can't add any user skills or equipment to the roll beyond the escalation ranged ability that's already on it. So we're just going to roll this again and see if we can get a little bit better of a result here. All right, so we got ourselves a four. That's a hit, and this is another hit. So we got two more hits and two misses. Well, seeing as he's kind of on that Gatling gun, we might as well go ahead and make another attack and just wipe them all out. Would have liked to kind of held on to that for something in the streets a little bit better, but whatever. Uh, that is going to be one hit. Wow, he is a terrible user of that Gatling gun. Pablito's turn is done, thank goodness, because that was absolutely terrifying to watch, and hopefully that is not the kind of success rate he gets when I push this wagon out into the open. So for now, we're going to go ahead and move to the next character. I will have Meg activate here. She's going to search. Meg being a gunslinger, she can only search once. She found herself a knife. She's hoping to search again the next time the player phase comes around. She's going to stop in this spawn zone area. I have a plan to take care of it, so I'm not worried about stopping there. I'll just discard the final action for her and not use it. 
Trixie is going to activate next, and she is going to head south to get close to Thomas to give him the water. So one action to move south, one action to trade the water, don't want to trade anything else or exchange anything else, and she's going to head back north right up next to the wagon. Thomas is now going to activate, has a lot to do on his turn. He's going to use his class ability called Vade Retro to place a VR token right here on the Abomination space. So it's placed on a space, and this is going to give him an additional plus one damage during combat. The reason this is important is because, again, he has a Henry Repeater at two damage. That will make it third which is enough to take it down. So as a faithful, he's able to boost up his damage, which is awesome. So he's going to spin around with his gun and he's going to be throwing three dice. Four plus is a hit and that abomination is taken out and he would gain five AP. Here's hoping he has a good roll because he needs to kill this thing off. Three plus, we got it. Just barely. We had two misses and one success. The Abomination is killed off. Also, the Vade Retro token, because there's no zombies left in that area, is also removed. Thomas also bumps up his AP, which goes from 3 up to 8. He now opens up another action. So at this point, he has two more actions to spend. Now, it's worth noting in terms of the noise token, it's not going to move back to Thomas's space because it's not equal to or greater than the same sound it's already on. In other words, the boom that came from the Gatling gun could be heard from so far away. That's where all the zombies attention is going towards. They don't really care about a pot shot. So with two actions, he has a perfect setup here to be able to use the water that he was traded. He's going to move into the space that's adjacent to the building. He'll discard the card in order to gain three AP. And as a faithful, he'll be able to take out the corpse pile spawn token. So Thomas jumps from eight to 11 in terms of AP. And what's even better is the fact that he neutralized another spawn zone. So now both spawn zones that are on the south side of the game board are resolved and we can work our way towards the middle of the game board and getting up to the northern side of things. Next up, I'm gonna activate Jeb, who's a townsfolk and do a lot of searching. So he's gonna search in the area he's in. He managed to find himself a pickaxe, which he'll place in his inventory, and he'll search a second time and finds a Winchester. This looks awesome. A one to three range, two dice, four plus, and a two damage weapon. This is exactly what I was hoping to find in this deck. This could be very handy. With his final action, he's going to move to the next space as I'm likely going to head him towards that balcony so he can start using that two damage weapon to take out some of the heavier enemies that should likely be in the center of the game board and within range in the near future. Carl went ahead and searched for the beginning of his turn and found Holy Water, which is exactly what any character needs, regardless of their class, to take care of a spawn, which is great. We're going to need this when we run into the corpse pile way up in the top right-hand corner. So a great card to get, especially when you can only search once. We'll be pocketing this with Carl and getting him on the move with the rest of the posse for a future move north. Now, Carl does have an additional action. He's got four actions because he's in the yellow area, but he's not going to use his fourth action. He doesn't really want to step any further out into the main area, knowing that there's a bunch of zombies that are going to be activating and moving forward in the near future. The whole posse is activated, and we're now ready to activate the zombies, and they're all going to be moving. Not a single one of them is within range of attacking. And just like that, all of the zombies are starting to pile into the center of the game board, making their way south. Now it's time to talk quickly about those long dead walkers that we have coming at us way up north. Now these particular zombies, they all deal with damage, they all take one point of damage to kill, and they all provide one adrenaline point. So nothing really crazy there in terms of their brothers, let's say, that are to the left of them, the regular walkers, but they have special rules. And their special rules state that the long dead walkers have the same target priority order as regular walkers, and they're still affected by walkers' extra activation cards. So if we get one, it's not just the walkers that move, but also the long dead walkers as well. All part of the walkers keyword. Now the next thing is unique to them. The long dead walkers are immune to ranged attacks. They are still affected by game effects eliminating all zombies in the zone like dynamite though. But you're not going to be able to pot shot them away with rifles and pistols. You're going to have to get up close and personal. So my brawler like Carl might be of good use in this situation but there's a whole gang of them so it might be more than he can handle. Now we're moving on to zombie spawns. The first card off the top is more long dead walkers. Four more of them coming in. The next spawn zone is four runners coming out of the east. 
The next card coming out is Brutes. That's going to be four of them. It's worth noting I am getting very low on the reserves for Brutes. I believe I only have one or two left. So that means if more of them start coming out beyond what I can handle in terms of activations, they're going to start activating and moving, which could be very bad. We're going to have to thin those herds and focus on that in the next player phase. The final spawn zone is the Abomination one, which does not trigger. This is going to flip to its inactive side. It's worth mentioning. I waited till now to mention this, but the second the Abominations are killed off of the game map, make sure to make this token inactive so you don't accidentally spawn anything at it. And honestly, right now, getting a break there and only having to spawn three different areas is a huge plus because we've got a lot of work to do. That's going to end off the zombie phase. The two things to do at the end of the round here is if we have a boom token showing, it's going to flip over to its bang side. And then the blue objective token up top is going to move one space to the east. And that, my friends, is going to wrap up part number one of Zombicide Undead or Alive Mission 1, The Bandwagon. Now, at this point in time, I'm feeling confident. I mean, we have three bounty weapons, and the token is just past the midway point mark. We have a lot of work to do, and we still need to get more bounty weapons. Three more, in fact, so that every single survivor has one. If we can pull this off in time for when the train arrives and get on top of the train without any zombies on board then we win i got a funny feeling it's not going to be as simple as it sounds i feel like in terms of where we're at we're in a decent place but the number of zombies on the board right now kind of scare me we need to get that gatling gun into the center area of the board and start blasting things to pieces i also need to get more of my characters with more weapons i currently have jeb holding a ton of guns and he is going to need to trade out a number of these guns to other individuals to give every the ability to sit maybe in the center tile there and start blazing away at all of the areas around it. We'll see how much we can clear up, but it's exciting. We'll see if we can win this scenario or we may die horribly, but either way, hopefully you'll join me in the next episode as we continue our play of Undead or Alive. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, keep on rolling solo.